are the truths that are represented on the 1843 chart. But according to inspiration, when God's people return to the foundation, there's going to be a shaking in Adventism. There will be some that r do not wish to return to those truths, and some that do. So, in connection with that, in early writings, page 74, when Sister White places the inspired endorsement on that chart, um, she says this, and it's on page 25 of your notes. She says, under the 1843 chart, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, and that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. That last expression gives room for people that don't want to return to the truth on that chart to say that, look at Sister White told us, there was mistakes on that chart. How can we go back to that chart when the Lord has plainly told us there were mistakes on that chart? Do you see that in, in there? That she says that, the, that his hand was over and hit a mistake in some of the figures, plural, not a singular, plural, so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Based upon that statement, they'll say, we can't have confidence in that chart. We've been plainly told there's figures on that chart that are mistaken. You understand the argument? Okay, in the same book, Early Writings, this is, this, I have it pulled up on the CD-ROM here, but in page 237 of Early Writings, uh oh, password what? Oh. S O S O what? Prophecy. Oh. Okay, here here's the same book where you find the quote we were just dealing with. Early writings, page two thirty seven. She says this, um, and I'm cutting into the middle of the paragraph. She says, These faithful, disappointed ones who could not understand why their Lord did not come were, le were not left in darkness. Again, they were led to their Bibles to search the prophetic periods. The hand... The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained. The mistake, singular. They saw that the prophetic periods reached to 1844 and that the same evidence which they had presented to show that the prophetic periods closed in 1843 proved that they would terminate in 1844. The mistake on the chart that the Lord held his hand over was the year 1843 and she says there was a mistake in some of the figures on this chart and this time prophecy identifies 1843 that was a mistake and this time prophecy also identifies 1843 that was the mistake too and this time prophecy also identifies 1843 the mistake singular that inspiration has pointed to on that chart was the year 1843 and when they made the corrections with this chart it's 1844 you can't use the spirit of prophecies comments if you're going to be consistent to say that there's errors on that chart based on early writing 74 because she explains that the error was the mistake of 1843. There's no way that you can use those statements to say, oh, they were mistaken about the trumpets or the 2520 or the 1290 and the 1335. You want to hand that backwards, por favor?
Now, one other thing. To, uh, last night, um, I mentioned a um, quote by James White, and I, and I couldn't pull it out. I do have the quote. But if you weren't here last night, and even if you were, you may not remember what I was suggesting. I was trying to, <coughs> trying to point out that when, when the book of Daniel was unsealed in 1798, and this may be hard for some of you that just got here today to follow, but when the book of Daniel was unsealed in 1798 by Christ for those people, that that unsealing is illustrated in Revelation chapter 5 and onward by Christ unseal removing the seven seals from the Bible, from the book that's sealed with seven seals. The, the work in Revelation of Christ removing the seven seals from the Bible is a parallel illustration to the work of Christ unsealing the book of Daniel in 1798. And James White understood it this way. And I don't know <coughs> if you've read the passage. I think it's in Councils to Writers and Editors. But Sister White compares James White as Moses to the Advent people in terms of Bible doctrine. Did you know that? She's, she tell, says that of James White. So, you know, James White no doubt made some errors in his theology. He wasn't a prophet. He was human. But Sister White has identified that when it comes to Bible understanding, that James White fulfilled the role of Moses to the Advent people. So this is, this is a statement by James White from uh, Review and Herald, November 1st, 1853. I'll read this into the record, and then we'll get into this next study. Um... Great light has been thrown of late upon the prophetic word. It shall come to pass that at even tide it shall be light. Zechariah 14.7 The vision is for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Habakkuk 2.3 In the latter days he shall consider it perfectly. Jeremiah 23.20 20, 30 and 24 What Daniel was commanded to seal up and close, Daniel 12.4, is now through the all-powerful mediation of the lion of the tribe of Judah revealed unto us. He's He's saying the book of Daniel here is being unsealed by the line of the tribe of Judah and the line of the tribe of Judah is Christ in Revelation 5 that begins to unseal the book that's sealed with seven seals. So he's drawing the connection. Hence many run to and fro and knowledge is increased. Never since the days of our Lord's first advent was the prophetic word so much studied. So many of the ambassadors of Christ engaged in this pursuit and so much written on this subject. The revelation of Jesus Christ contained in the apocalypse showing the coming of the just one with all his saints to the destruction of the apostate nations is now made so plain to the church that none can or at least ought to be ignorant of it. This however is a privilege belonging only to the faithful for it is written that none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand. Daniel 12.10 so St. Paul speaks, but you brethren are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. First Thessalonians 4, 4 and 5. Though the true light now shineth it and enlighten only those who believe. Those who are paying a prayerful attention to these things have, like the Israelites of old, light in their dwellings, whilst the rest of the world are sitting in darkness, even darkness such as may be felt. The opening then and the unfolding of the prophetic word is another convincing proof that we are arrived at the end of the age. The unsealing of prophecy and the revelation of the mystery of God being reserved unto the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, says Dr. Clark. Many shall endeavor to search out the sense, and knowledge shall be increased by these means. Um, and he goes on a little bit. There's other points there, but I want you to understand that it's not simply uh, my, my singular opinion that when the book of Daniel was unsealed, that this is also illustrated by the work of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, removing the seals in Revelation 5 and onward, one at a time. They're parallel arguments. This is, we were dealing with that theme last night. I looked for that quote last night and didn't have it. I wanted to put it into the record. This, it, it, the newsletter it's in is in December 2008. 
If you would like to be on our monthly newsletter, um, give us your name and address. Give my wife your name and address. We try to send out a monthly newsletter. Sometimes it's bi-monthly. <laughs> um, we're starting on page 29 uh, of our notes. Revelation 18. I stated that I was a manuscript releases volume 13 page 334 I stated that I was a stockholder and I could not let the resolution pass and there was to be a special light for God's people as they neared the closing scenes of this earth's history this is a problem in Adventism many of us do not expect that there is to be a special light for God's people at the end of the world and if you do not expect or believe that there will be then you will undoubtedly not look for it and if you don't seek you do not find okay so this is a this is a real problem in Adventism and, and then w once you accept that there is going to be a special light then you have the the work of deciding for of all the different voices out there in Adventism which is the genuine light and which is a distraction there is, was to be special light for God's people as they neared the closing scenes of this earth's history. Another angel was to come from heaven with a message and the whole earth was to be lightened with his glory. It would be impossible for us to state just how this additional light would come. It might come in a very unexpected manner, in a way that would not agree with the ideas that many have conceived. It is not at all unlikely or contrary to the ways and works of God to send light to his people in unexpected ways. So when this new light comes at the end of the world, the inference here, I think that's easy to see in the spirit of prophecy, is the new light arrives for God's people in a way that the majority of God's people don't think it's going to arrive. Okay? There's a lot of ways to describe that. You know, I actually, when was it? I'm thinking, that's, I'm not looking at anything. <laughs> I look back there and I see other people looking back there. Um, in the recent past, I know this happened, it's just not popping into my mind. It was a, it was a pastor somewhere and, and plainly said, plainly said, if new light is to come, it's going to come through the general conference and they're going to send out an announcement. And, I, I, and I'm, not, I'm not belittling it. That I believe that that is a, a concept that some of us hold on to without even thinking it, without actually conceptualizing it as well as he did it as our mind. We've, we've been trained as human beings to look at human beings and we d it's just a natural thing to think, well, if there's a special mo message coming, it comes from, from the top down. Um, and, but to hear somebody express it was... And uh, so anyway, Revelation 18, the special light of Revelation 18. Let's look at Revelation 18 f and, and put into context what the verses that we're looking at this stu study. Um, we're saying that, we're teaching here that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000 and in the Millerite history on August 11th, 1840, the mighty angel of Revelation 10 descended and empowered the movement and he also brought a book open in his hand that began a testing process among God's people and as Seventh-day Adventists we know at the end of the world the mighty angel of Revelation 18 descends so we're, we're saying in a kind of a simple parallel that when the angel of Revelation 18 descends that's the parallel to the descent of the angel of Revelation 10 okay and we're saying that because we know that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000 so in Revelation 18 verse 1 it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with its glory. It doesn't say, and, you know, California was lightened with its glory. And the reason I'm saying that is in all these reform movements, at this way mark, the, you see a worldwide aspect identified. Not simply that the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world, but in all these reform lines, you have a, enough witnesses, all you need is two or three to establish something, that one of the characteristics of this point in time is worldwide. And sure enough, when this angel comes down, the whole earth is lightened with his glory. So we're, this is allowing us to 
place the descent of this angel right here in these characteristics of the reform movement. This isn't the only thing that allows us to do that. The earth is lightened with his glory and then in verse 2 he's going to cry out, okay? And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And then in verse 4, and, and I heard another voice. There are two voices in these verses. Two angels. I mean, when we talk about the fourth angel's message, which I think is an acceptable way to identify Revelation 18, we talk about the fourth angel. But when we look closely at Revelation 18, we can see two angels. Because the one angel comes down and he cries mightily, Babylon is fallen. But in verse 4, and I heard another voice. It doesn't say, and he also said. He says, and I heard another voice. Okay, so this is, this is two angels. And that voice in verse 4 says, I, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. And uh, of course, one of the things that you can show, and we'll touch this briefly in this presentation, is the time when the the point in time when the call to come out of her arrives is at the Sunday law. It's at the Sunday law uh, that God's people that received the seal of God began to call the eleventh hour workers out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Uh, this is an important point to to mark because if we call people out of Babylon, come out of her, my people, at the Sunday law, then evidently verses one through three is describing events that precede the Sunday law. So in on the, po um, on the bottom of page 29, there's a quote. It carries on to the next page. It's from Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 291. It says, a loud voice, okay? And this, this, this fourth angel, we understand in Adventism, one of the ways that we identify the fourth angel is this is the loud cry message because he cries with a loud voice. He, he joins the third angel's message and this is the loud cry. But we want to mark what the loud cry, the loud voice represents and Sister White tells this to us. The truth for this time, the third angel's message, is to be proclaimed with a loud voice meaning with increasing power. So the loud voice is, dis is telling us that when the, the fourth angel joins the third here, that it's not that a singular shout, but this message, it's describing an escalation of power as it moves forward. Okay? That's, that's how I understand this quote. And that's also consistent with what is illustrated by these reform lines. This is escalating. It's growing in power as it as it moves through history. The present truth for this time comprises the messages of the third the messages, the third angel's message succeeding the first and second. The presentation of this message with all it embraces is our work. Now if Sister White says the third angel's message is justification by faith in verity. Are you familiar with that quote? Usually Adventists are familiar with that quote. And there's there's people that stumble over my material for a variety of reasons, but some of them stumble because they say, look at, say, look at, Sister White says, the third angel's message is justification by faith in verity, and you're saying so many other things about the third angel's message, but notice what she just said. The presentation of this message with all it embraces is our work. We stand as the remnant people in these last days to promulgate the truth and swell the cry of the third angel's wonderful distinct message given, giving the trumpet a certain sound. <laughs> I, won't say I won't say much about the trumpet. <laughs> eternal truth which we have adhered to from the beginning. Eternal truth which we have it, e adhered to from the beginning. What's the eternal truth that Ellen White adhered to from the beginning? The truths represented on that chart. 
Our eternal truth, which we have adhered to from the beginning, is to be maintained in all its increasing importance to the close of probation. The truths on those charts increase in importance as we go to the close of probation. Remember, how many were here last night and read through with us M William Miller's dream? The foundational truths William, in William Miller's dream, they sh shone as bright as the sun. But at the end of the time period, which is the end of the world in William Miller's dream, how, how bright did those truths shine? Ten times. She's, she's consistent with herself. Those truths on that chart are going to be magnified tenfold at the end of the world. The trumpet, <laughs> it, she says it here again, the second time in here, the trumpet. She doesn't say the seals, the churches, the trumpet is to give a certain time. You can't do that. It's a bad example. But go ahead. I'm going to let you get away with it. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Definitely save those ones for the end. All right. The next paragraph. <laughs> the message is to come to the churches. We are to consider the bless best plans for accomplishing this. Faith, eternal faith in, in the past and in the present truth is to be talked, is to be prayed, is to be presented with pen and voice. The third angel's message in clear, distinct, in definite terms is to be made the prominent warning. All that it, all that it comprehends, all that it comprehends is to ma be made intelligible to the reasoning minds of today. Now, um, if uh, I was... I w we stayed up talking till beyond midnight last night and there are some here, I don't know what percentage, I realize that some here um, are not familiar with the, the basics, even the basics it appears of the history of 1888 and the message that Jones and Wagner bought, brought and that's unfortunate. We should understand that history uh, because that is a, a history that inspiration is clear the Lord tried to pour out his Holy Spirit the latter rain upon his people during that time period so if we're going to understand what takes place when the latter rain is poured out we have that history to look for to find some of the details of what we are to expect and from that history Sister White made comments on the messages that Jones and Wagner presented to the brethren during that time period righteousness by faith victory over sin and this is one of the classic ones but it's also one that is often used to try to say that what we're suggesting about the third angel's message is not valid. So I want to read this the, from Select the Messages, book one, page 362. The time of test is just on us for the loud cry of the third angel. And what's the loud cry of the third angel? The loud cry of the third angel is when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it. And it begins to swell the message with increasing power. The loud, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. And who is, who is presenting the revelation of the righteousness of Christ that she's speaking about here? Jones and Wagner. She's saying the message that they're, that they're presenting is the revelation of the righteousness of Christ and the loud cry of the third angel has begun. And it, it was beginning, but we stopped it. There's places where she says by our own actions we stopped it. But anyway... The loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. So when people listen to the material we share, a common criticism, probably at least partially accurate, is Pippinger spends too much time presenting the prophecy and he spends no time speaking about justification and sanctification, victory over sin, and the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. And that's a stumbling block for some, some. And my style of presentation certainly has a great deal of correction could be accomplished if I would, you know, do things properly. I'm not denying that. But what I do want to point out here is when you use this quote to oppose this message, what she's saying is, is the message that Jones and Wagner were presenting was the beginning of the light. And the, 
the loud cry is a message that increases with power it has a beginning she doesn't say that the message they presented was the light of the third angel's message or was the loud cry she says it was the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth these angels both the angels of Revelation 14 the three angels messages in Revelation 14 and as we are suggesting to you the two angels in Revelation 18 and I'm saying two angels because the verse 2 we see him crying out and in verse 4 we see another we hear another voice what are these angels from selected messages book 3 page 405 the third angel is represented as flying in the midst of heaven symbolizing the work of those who proclaim the first second and third angels messages all are linked together the angels of Revelation 14 and Revelation 18 are not angels they are symbols representing the work that the people of God accomplish okay, that's that's what they are they're symbols and she says it more than once N next quote concerning Revelation 18 another angel is to come down from heaven this angel represents the giving of the loud cry which is to come from those who are preparing to cry mightily with a strong voice Babylon the great is fallen so these angels represent the work that the people of God do next quote 1888 materials 926 John saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the whole earth was lightened with his glory that work is the voice of the people proclaiming a message of warning to the world so if we're going to understand the angels of Revelation 14 and the angels of Revelation 18 and all that they embrace if we're going to consider all the light that's been revealed about them part of the light that's been revealed about these angels is that they're they're symbolically representing the work that is accomplished by God's people during the histories where they are fulfilled is that a fair overview of those statements okay um, last night we looked at uh, on the next quote where it says Millerite history repeated last night we looked at the fact that Sister White identifies the seven thunders of Revelation 10 verse 4 as a delineation of events that would transpire under the history of the first angel and the second angel's message the first angel technically arrives in 1798 empowered 1840 second angel's message arrives 1842 empowered at the midnight cry then the third angel's message arrives but sister white says the seven thunders represent the events and she says a delineation of events and delineate means to set forth upon a line the events that take place uh, in this line of history from 1798 to 1844 are the seven thunders then in the next quote from the same passage she also said that the seven thunders represent future events after these seven thunders uttered their voices the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered these relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order and what we're saying is the seven thunders represents the history of the Millerites but it also represents the history of the hundred and forty four thousand but because the seven thunders here are the seven thunders there these events here will parallel these events here and this is an agreement with the fact they're the events Millerite history is repeated to the very letter P parable of the ten virgins um, and we're, we're going to get to those quotes I'm moving past that <laughs> not a problem uh, I can do that with her maybe um, the next quotes Matthew 25 we're trying to nail down that Millerite history repeated uh, we've already mentioned this a few times from Great Controversy 393 the parable of the ten virgins illustrates the experience of the Adventist people and then the quote that brother Paul was mentioning in the question previously um, I'm often referred to the parable of ten virgins five of whom were wise and five foolish this parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled in the Millerite history to the very letter but it's fulfilled again to the very letter and so the seven thunders representing this history and representing this history is emphasizing the events of these histories 
<coughs> the events of this history is just like the events of this history which are the seven thunders are events that are going to fulfill the parable of the ten virgins to the very letter they're, they're parallel point by point histories under Revelation 14 Revelation 14 was fulfilled in history here Okay, first angel's message arrives in 1798. The first angel's message is empowered in 1840. Second angel's message arrives in 1842. It's empowered in 1844. The third angel's message arrives on October 22nd, 1844. Um, did in 1799 did the students of prophecy understand that the first angel's message had arrived? No, 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 no. In July of 1842, did the Millerites understand that the second angel's message had arrived? On October 23rd, 1844, did they understand that the third angel's message had arrived? No. It's not based on when God's people understood these things. It's based on when the historical evidence identifies that they arrived. And the third angel's message is a warning against receiving the mark of the beast. And on October 22nd, 1844, Christ moved into the holy place, which meant that you could see into the holy place, most holy place, which means you could see into the most holy place, and therefore you could see the Ark of the Covenant, and you could look in there and you could see the Ten Commandments, and when you looked at the Ten Commandments, you could see the Sabbath, and suddenly you could understand the logic between Sabbath and Sunday and the mark of the beast, which is the third angel's message, it had arrived at that point. That's the logic uh, there. So in the next quote under Revelation 14, from manuscript releases, volume 16, page 40, it says, the whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of the Lord. The pure in heart shall see God. It is those who are following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth that will receive power from that angel that came down from heaven having great power. How do you follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth? Now, there's more than one correct answer to this. I'll give you one answer, though, that I submit is valid. One of the ways that we are required to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes, goeth is that in these histories, fulfilling the role of the Lion of the tribe of Judah at the beginning of every one of these reform movements, he opens up a prophetic message and he expects the wise to follow him as he continually unseals this message through this history. You have to follow the Lamb through this history, this reform movement history, wherever he goes. And in this sense, you're following him through the opening of the prophetic word that is being accomplished by the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay? It is those who are following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth that will receive power from that angel that came down from heaven having great power. The first message is to be repeated. The first angel's message is to be repeated. Hmm. First angel's message is in here. She's saying it's to be repeated. Okay. The first angel's message is to be repeated, proclaiming the second advent of Christ to our world. The second angel's message is to be repeated. So not only do the seven thunders teach that the Millerite history is repeated, and Matthew 25 teaches that the Millerite history is to be repeated, Revelation 14, correctly understood, tells us that the first and second angel's message, which is the seven thunders, is to be repeated. And that's not even dealing with the parallel reform movements. All right. Now on the bottom of the page is a an important quote from my mind. The bottom of page 31 from 1888 materials, page 804. <coughs> it says, God has given us the messages of Reve have God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy. What does she mean? Well, here's the line of prophecy. And God has given them their place. Where's the place of the first angel's message? Well, 1798, it's empowered 1840. The second angel's message place, 1842, empowered here. Third angel's message arrives here. It's, when she's talking about them be given their place, she's talking about their historical arrival. She's not talking about what the th theological content of the messages that the angels proclaim represents. She's talking about where they were located in history when they were fulfilled. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy and their work is not to cease till the close of this his earth's history. 
The first and second angels' messages are still truth for this time. And here's the important part. And they are to run parallel with that which follows. What follows the first and second angels' message? The third. So, it, this is the history of the first and second angels' message. This is the history of the fulfillment uh, to the very letter of the parable of the ten virgins. This is the history of the arrival of Revelation 14. This is the history of the seven thunders. And now Sister White is saying that what which follows the history of the first and second angel's message is to parallel the first and second angel's message. Now you'll notice the first message, it goes through history for a time and then it's empowered, correct? What's going to follow the first and second angel's message is the third angel's message right here. It arrives in history and it goes through history for a time until, and we know it's empowered when the fourth angel joins it, right? So we know it began to go through history in 1844, but Sister White says that which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. So what we're going to do here is if you back up over here, this is 1844. This history here, 1844, I'm bringing it down here because it's going to run parallel with that history. And the third angel's message has been going through history since 1844. Just as William Miller's message went through history. Okay? The third angel's message is to run parallel with the first and second angel's message. So what we're doing, we're just taking the third angel, we're bringing it down here, and one of the characteristics of the first angel's message is it goes through history for a period of time, and then it is empowered. So the third angel's message has been going through history for a period of time. And we know, what happens when the third angel's message is empowered? The mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins it. So without even dealing with what it was, what historical event, we're saying that it's empowered when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins with it. And this parallels when the angel of Revelation 10 came down and empowered the first angel's message. Is that a consistent parallel so far? Okay. Th that, that which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. So we're saying here, goes through history, the mighty angel comes down, but we're also saying that it's at this history, August 11th, 1840, that the first angel's message was what? In Sister White's words, carried to every mission station in the world. It was a worldwide event. So we're saying that when the angel here of Revelation 18 comes down, not necessarily, I didn't mean to say worldwide event. It, it, it had a, world, a worldwide component to them. Each of these these characteristics in these reform lines have a worldwide characteristic to them. We're saying that the worldwide characteristic to this when the angel come down was the fact that everyone saw what happened on September 11th, 2001. It was a worldwide understanding. Um, and of course then we're saying that it's in this history here um, now remember, some of you weren't here yesterday. In Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 13, is a passage where Isaiah raises the question, whom shall, whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall understand doctrine, them that are weaned from the breast, milk drawn from the breast? But precept it must be up on precept. And then in verse 12, it, it talks about the refreshing, and we are saying from that passage last night, I'm tr trying to summarize this down, that the latter rain message, the refreshing message, is a message that is taught by bringing line upon line, line upon line, from here in the Bible and there a Bible, here a little, there a little. That's how the latter rain message will be taught, because Isaiah 28, 9 through 13 is talking about the refreshing, and in Great Controversy 611, Sister White says, the refreshing is the latter rain. So what we're saying is that in the reform movement of Noah, Noah is the one that formalizes the message 
And when he brings this message in this history, he has to first build the template, the foundation that he's going to construct the ark on. This is Noah. Um, Moses, the message of that time period was worship. In this history here, Moses presents Sabbath reform, which is the foundation of worship. Okay, In the history of John the Baptist of Christ in this history it was John that proclaimed the foundational message um, in the history of we we'll call it Cyrus the three decrees it was in the history of the first decree that the foundation of the temple was laid now I'm saying it's this technique, taking these reform movements and bringing them together line up on line. This is how you illustrate the history of the latter reign, which is all these reform movements are pointing forward to. And that in each of these histories, at this point, you see the foundation of that history marked. All right. William Miller is used to lay the foundational truths for Millerite history. Therefore, in this history, immediately after 9-11, the foundation, the foundational work or understanding for the 144,000 will have to be identified. And in Isaiah 58, verse 12, it says this. And they that shall be of thee, he's speaking about the end of the world, and they that be of the 144,000, and they that shall be of thee shall build up the wo waste places and thou, thou shall raise up the foundations of many generations one of the works that's accomplished by the 144,000 in the latter rain time period and the way they accomplish this work is by bringing together line upon line is they raise up the foundation of many generations for God's people for God's people because they're teaching it whom shall he teach knowledge the way the latter rain message is taught is by bringing line upon line together and as you bring these reform lines together you're seeing the foundation of Noah the foundation of Moses of John the Baptist of Cyrus of William Miller the foundations of many generations in order to emphasize the foundational work that's accomplished by the 144,000. And what's the foundational work that's accomplished by the 144,000? They return to the foundational truths represented on tho that chart and they teach it to God's people. How do they teach it? By bringing line upon line, line upon line from here in the Bible and there in the Bible. Do you see it? Okay. <laughs> and I'm submitting to you that that the emphasis of the return to the 1843 chart and the foundational truths that's being placed upon this particular message, it arrived in this history after this event, right on time, in agreement with the reform lines. And it's those kind of those kind of things that really make it hard to shake what's being unfolded by the Lord. I mean, it's just, it's too crystal clear. So in any case, at the same time, in this history up here, the 1843 chart becomes present truth for the Millerites. They use it for outreach, but in this time, the 1843 chart once again becomes present truth, not for outreach for, for the 144,000, but for inreach, because it's the tool that helps them lead other Adventists back to the foundations. What's ahead because that which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. What's ahead in this history, after the angel comes down with this worldwide event, and the foundations are, we're returning to the foundations, what is, what's ahead based upon this history, this history here says that the second angel arrived when the Protestants of the United States stood against the message, and it's prefiguring when the Protestants of the United States closed their door against the message at the Sunday Law of the United States. At which point, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is purified, that wheat is separated from the tares. And what do we proclaim? Come out of her, my people. This is Revelation 18, verse 4. This is Revelation 18, verse 4. 
This is Revelation 18.1 when the angel comes down and the earth is lightened with his glory. Verses 1 through 3 is here. This is verse 4. Come out of her, my people. Sunday, Protestants in the United States, Protestants in the United States. Enemies, enemies. It's running parallel. It's a perfect parallel. It's at this point, the Millerites proclaim the midnight cry. It's at this point, what do we proclaim? The loud cry. The midnight cry ends on October 22nd, 1844, when judgment begins. The loud cry ends when Michael stands up and judgment closes. Do you see the parallel? Do you think a human being could invent that? <laughs> no way. No way. Okay, page uh, 32. Now, by putting September 11, 2001 up here, I, I acknowledge at this point we have not began to make the arguments on why that is Islam. But, Lord willing, we will do that. Of the notes. We have till one. Is my watch correct? Oh, we got, we're, we're marching right through this. Okay, then this, this particular, it's good that we all have notes here because this particular argument that I'm going to put forth I think is very difficult to follow unless you can read it for yourself, all right? What we're saying in Millerite history is going to run parallel with the history of the 144,000. Okay. But <laughs> if, you're, if, if we begin to uh, bring all the, the, prof the prophecies together on this, you will also put along this Daniel 11 verse 40 right here 1989 okay now th th this this is this is a, a mind blower for me okay it amazes me that this happens in Daniel 11 verse 40 we dealt with this a little bit last night Daniel 11 verse 40 says and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push against him that means in 1798 atheistic France is going to deliver the deadly wound to the papacy because the time of the end, we read it today, is 1798. So verse 40 begins by marking the time of the end for the Millerites, all right? Verse 40 of Daniel 11 marks the time of the end for the Millerites, 1798. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. But when you get to the end of verse 40, it's describing the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, and it's marking the time of the end for the 144,000. Both times of the end are marked for the Millerites and the 144,000 in the same verse. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> that blows my mind <laughs> if, if you get the significance. But in any case, the next thing that happens in Daniel 11.40 is verse 41, which is the Sunday law in the United States. Okay, so this, this sequence is you can you can defend this this sequence of events through other lines of prophecy other than just revelation 18 and when you bring these other lines together line upon line there is more strength in this presentation than we could possibly bring in one weekend um, on the top of page 32 there, this is an argument that it would take a little bit of time to walk through but sister white is going to talk about the history of the millerites here okay and she says, I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going on on earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel. And it, when we read the context, you'll see that this is the first angel. All right? A mighty angel. And you'll notice that the first angel, it's a singular angel. Okay? And yet that'll mean something in a minute. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second appearing. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I, to I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and warn men of the coming wrath. Multitudes received the light. Now you haven't read far enough along here to, to positively perhaps know that she's talking about the first angel. Um, but if you drop down to the 
third paragraph there it says and the people of God united in the cry of the second angel so there she's given us a, a, a point of reference where we know we know that the angel here in the first paragraph is the first angel you see what I'm saying she's talking about the first angel's message of Revelation 14 and what did she say his mission was what was the mission of the first angel No, you, you're missing the part that's bold-faced. Uh, I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory. I thought the first angel's message was, I saw another angel, or I saw an angel in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel. For, but it doesn't say that his mission was to lighten the earth with his whole glory in Revelation 14, does it? What angel is to lighten the earth with his own glory? Yes, the angel of Revelation 18. Sister White here is being consistent. She's paralleling this history with this history. She's making sure that we understand that this is a parallel history, if we will see it, okay? Second paragraph, and another mighty angel, the second angel, was commissioned to descend to the earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing, and as he came to the earth, he cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Is Babylon is fallen? Is that the second angel's message? Yes. As the people of God united in the second cry of the second angel, the heavenly host marked with deepest interest the effect of the message. Now notice this. The first angel and the second angel have been singular angels. But now she's going to teach us about the midnight cry right here. Okay, and it says, Jesus commissioned other angels, plural, not a singular angel, to fly quickly and revive and strengthen the drooping faith of his people and to prepare them to understand the message of the second angel and the important move which was to be made in heaven. I saw these angels, plural, receive great power and light from Jesus and fly quickly to fulfill their commission to aid the second angel in his work. A great light shone upon the people of God as the angels cried, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And all I want you to see here, and I warned you, this is a, the hard one to follow, particularly if I'm presenting it. The first angel is singular, the second angel is singular, but the third Midnight cry is a group of angels and what do the angels represent? The work that the people of God accomplished. But as Sister White is talk, describing for us this work, it's singular, singular, plural. Okay? Now the next place, the next quote, which is also from early writings, <coughs> she's not speaking um, to about Millerite history, she's speaking about the history of the 144,000. She says, I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to earth, and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel, singular, commissioned to descend to the earth and unite his voice with the third angel, singular. The first angel was singular, the third angel was singular. Um, now there's an angel going to come down and unite with it, paralleling eight. 1840 um, and give power and force to his message great power and glory were imparted to the angel as he descended and the earth was lightened with his glory the light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere as he singular cried mightily with a strong voice Babylon the great has fallen and has fallen um, and and this is verse 2 of Revelation 18 the message of the fall of Babylon is given by the second angel, singular, is repeated, with the additional mentions of the corruptions which have been entering the church since 1844. The work of this angel, this is the angel of Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3, singular, comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of their temptation and they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them and they united fearlessly to proclaim the third angel's message. Now notice. Angels, plural, were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven and I heard voices, plural, which seemed to sound everywhere, come out of her, my people. Where do we see come out of her, my people? That's the other voice of Revelation 18 verse 4. It's the loud cry paralleling the midnight cry the midnight cry was a group of angels and the loud cry is a group of angels this history parallels this history single angel single angel group of angels single angel single angel group of angels this is just a very 
it's a little bit harder to see this, but this is just another argument that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. It's all, it's the same history once again repeated. Do you see that? But that is a little bit of an obscure argument, isn't it? It's harder to see. No? Okay. All right. But it's here in verse 4 of Revelation 18 when the loud cry technically arrives. Now, what did Sister White say? Sister White said when Jones and Wagner presented their message that this was the beginning of the loud cry of the third angel's message. And when did they present their message? Way back here in 1888. So there, the loud cry of the third angel's message has been going through history. And what does the term loud cry mean? Increasing in power. This is where we started in this presentation. So the fact that that it started with Jones and Wagner does not deny the fact that the the direct or the the more specific fulfillment of the loud cry is the history that takes place at the Sunday law when the the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure upon God's people. You ever heard that the Sunday, that the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure? But it's poured out without measure. What's it? What's it matter? What's it mean if you pour something out without measure? You just pour it out. Okay. At the Sunday law, God's church has been purified. Those people in Adventism that receive the seal of God receive the seal of God, and those that receive the mark of the beast receive the mark of the beast. They're separated. There's no measure. He just pours it out on those that have the seal of God. But before that time, when the wheat and tear are still together, he's pouring it out with measure. That's why in Testimonies to Ministers, page 507, she says, The latter rain may, may be falling on hearts all around them, but they will not recognize or receive it. There's a time in Adventism when the wheat and tear are still together, and the wheat begin to receive the sprinkling of the latter rain, and the tares don't, and the Holy Spirit is being poured out with measure. That arrives here. That arrives here. But at the Sunday law, when the church is purified, then the loud cry, then the plural angels arrive, and the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. <clears throat> I don't have a problem with that. But it's, I'm not, I don't want to try to explain that right now, but I agree with you. Okay, page 33. Um, None are top page signs of the Times, November 18th, eight, 1899. This uh, soon that'll be okay, but right now this window, <laughs> yeah. None are contemned and condemned until they have had light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of, his beast, of the beast and, of, and his image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Do you see that Sister White is saying that at the Sunday law the loud cry goes forth? She says... She says that's the loud cry at the Sunday law, correct? How is it that she says that Jones and Wagner brought the loud cry? We read that at the beginning. This is the beginning of the loud light of the... It's progressive. And there is, a, there is a, a general understanding of the loud cry of the third angel that continues through, his, through history. But the specific application of the loud cry is at the Sunday law. And it's parallel in the history of the midnight cry. Are you following my argument? And Brother Ben, you have to save your questions to the end. But if it's a brief one-liner. Okay, that's, that's, that is true, especially when you're talking about country living, but we're not there. But yes, that's a good point. Okay, so what we're saying is the loud cry begins technically, officially, or however you want to express it at the Sunday Law in the United States, and that is the other voice that says, come out of her, my people. All right? Um, notice Revelation, or Maranatha 173, page 33 of your notes. 
Revelation 18 points to a time when as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the church will have fully, fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. When those that believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and believe a lie, who are those who did not believe the truth at this point? This is this, she's talking about the Sunday law. And she's going to, she has a few, few things to say here. But she's saying here at the Sunday law, this is when those that did not believe the truth, that received strong delusion are identified. Who are they? This is Seventh-day Adventists that did not receive the love of the truth that receive strong delusion. Okay, now, now that this same, this same manifestation goes all the way through the Sunday Law crisis and if, if a, uh, someone outside of Adventism here is finally c confronted with a Sabbath Sunday truth and he decides for Sunday, he too will not love the truth and he's going to receive strong delusion. But Sister White here is marking the strong de delusion that comes at the Sunday Law and it comes in connection with the judgment of the living that's taking place and judgment begins in the house of God and the first people to receive the strong delusion. The people that she is identifying here are Adventists that received the mark of the beast at the Sunday law. Because it's at this point that God's other children begin to be called out of Babylon. Okay, and, and she referenced that here. Revelation 18 points to a time when as, as the result of rejecting the threefold message, warning message of Revelation 14, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel and the people of God still in Babylon, outside of Adventism, will be called upon to separate from her communion, separate from Babylon. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. When those that believed not the Advent truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie, then at that point the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it and all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call, come out of her my people. Revelation 18 verse 4. So you see what she's describing here? It's at the Sunday law that Adventists receive strong delusion. It's at this point that the call to the eleventh hour workers, God's other children in Babylon, goes forth and it is, come out of her my people, come out of Babylon. All right. uh, next quote, Selected Messages, Book 2, page 118. The prophet says, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was light with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen has fallen, has become the habitation of devils. This is the same message that was given by the second angel. And now she's going to tell us that the message of the second angel here, up here in this history, okay, and that parallels this history, now she's going to go into the history of Christ. She's going to say, here's another parallel history to, to these histories, all right? She says, when Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second temple cleansing. So in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message, and she quotes it. And then she says, and in a loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. That's Revelation 18, verse 4, right? So Sister White here is saying, that here, in this history, Christ cleansed the temple, and then at the Sunday law, he's going to cleanse the temple again. And in the fulfillment of this history, when he cleansed the temple, in fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins, the door was closed in the parable, right? And the closing of the door in the parable of the ten virgins parallels the closing of the door into the holy place on October 22nd, 1844 and Christ cleansed his temple. And the Millerite movement went from 50,000 down to 50 overnight. And that's what happened when Christ cleansed the temple when he was on earth. He came into the temple and he drove the money changers 
and the unsanctified out. The, the amount of people in the temple was reduced. He did that twice in his history and Sister White compares this twofold cleansing to the cleansing that took place in the Millerite history when the door closed and the Millerites went from 50,000 down to 50 overnight. And then Sister White says that this cleansing is repeated in this parallel history when the door closes on Adventism here. What's that tell you about Adventism? From 50,000 down to 50 overnight? It tells us that the majority of Seventh-day Adventists are preparing for the mark of the beast. Doesn't it? Next quote. And, and the door closes for us at the Sunday Law. All right, That's, that's where probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists. Take each verse from Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 270. Take each verse of this chapter and read it carefully, especially the last two. She's speaking of Revelation 18. She quotes the last two verses. And then she compares the last two verses of Revelation 18 with the parable of the ten virgins when she says the parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself and every specification should be carefully studied. But time will come when the door will be shut. We are represented either by the wise or the foolish virgins. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we the authority to say who are the wise and who are the foolish. There are those who hold the truth and unrighteousness, and these appear outwardly like the wise. Next quote, Review and Herald, June 15, 1897. When those who have, the, have had abundance of light, and you know when she talks about those of us that have had abundance of light, she doesn't just say those of us that, we're not just, it's not just those of us that have abundance of light that are being addressed. Inspiration is clear that I am treated as one that has abundance of light if I've had the availability of that light and chose not to receive that light I am still judged as one that had the abundance of light I'm held accountable not for the light al that I have alone but for the light that I could have had if I would have availed myself of the the opportunity to receive the light that's how the Lord looks upon us and when sister writes talking about those of us that have abundance of life she's talking about Seventh-day Adventists okay and she says when those who have had abundance of life throw off the restraint which the word of God uh, imposes and make void his laws, others, this is the Sunday law, will come in and fill their place and take their crown. Testimonies, volume 9, page 97. Oh, the people, oh, that the people of God might know the time of their visitation. The time of our visitation, brothers and sisters, is right now. This is it. And, and I'm not, not saying that in a, just a general uh, metaphorical way. You can show that the time of the visitation in these reform lines is when the divine symbol comes down. Because when Jesus came down on August 11th, 1840, he had the book of Daniel open in his hand marking that the testing process began. That time of visitation for the Millerites was underway and they were required to go take the book out of his hand and eat it. If they didn't go eat it, they flunked the test. When that angel came down, the time of visitation began. Therefore, when this angel came down, the time of visitation for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world was underway. I have to eat. Oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments is a time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. What's the time of God's destructive judgments? She says more than once. At the Sunday Law, national apostasy is followed by national ruin. This time period after the Sunday Law is the time of God's destructive judgment, but it's a time of mercy for those of God's children that are still in Babylon. Because they've had not yet had opportunity to learn the truth of Sabbath and Sunday. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not enter. Seventh-day Adventists. At the Sunday Law, the Lord stretches out his hands to those who have not heard the truth and they can come and they can stand with Christ but at the same time the United States 
is taking the hand of the papacy. The, the grasping of the hands is a prophetic symbol marking which camp you're going into. Are you taking the hand of Christ at this testing time or the hand of the papacy? And it begins at the Sunday law. Revelation 18.4. And there is a, another quote along that line. Another quote. Two other quotes. And then the last quote so we can get finished here. <coughs> Page 35, Re Review and Herald, July 5th, 1906. It, 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 takes, it takes a while. If, you, if you're hearing this quote for the first time, it, I hope it takes a little while for you to come to grips with this quote. There was a, a, a sister that sent me this quote on, by an email. And she says, what do you think about this quote? And you, when we read it in a minute, you'll know why she was saying that. And I says, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't see it. And her email, where she asked me the question with the quote, I went ahead and I put her email question in our newsletter and I, and I put my answer. Oh, I don't see much significance to it. And then several months later, I came across this quote all by myself in my own studies and it just... It's just, whoa, that, I get it. This is what this quote means. But I, I had forgotten that she had, she had, you know, mentioned that. So I was at a, a meeting where I was sharing about this quote. And she says, Brother Pippinger, Brother Pippinger, don't you remember <laughs> I sent you an email about this quote and you, you said it didn't mean anything? And I, at that point, I didn't remember, but it's true. So when I came across this quote, I sent it out to several friends. And I sent it to one friend by email. And he went into the old Review and Herald articles, the, the volumes which he had, to look at it in its context. And when he got there, he had circled this quote and put the date that he circled it, and he circled it within a couple days after September 11, 2001, put the date and put a question mark by it. He'd seen it, but he didn't get it, okay? It wasn't until, you know, a, a year ago or so that it clicked for him fully too. Now comes the word that I've declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. This I have never said. I have said as I looked at the great buildings going up there story after story what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18 will be f 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. The whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth. But I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming on New York only. So she says I have no light. But she says only this little piece of light. Only I know that one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. From the light given me, I know that destruction is in the world. One word from the Lord, one touch of his mighty power, and these massive structures will fall. Scenes will take place, the fearfulness of which we cannot imagine. And when you read that a few times, you realize that it's grammatically correct to say that when the great buildings of New York City came down, then... Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 arrived in history and the great buildings of New York City came down on September 11th, 2001. The angel descended and the testing time of the 144,000 began. And if you don't eat the book that's in the angel's hand, you flunk the test. But if you begin to eat the book, you realize you've never tasted anything sweeter in your life. And you also know that the greatest time of trouble that's ever been is on the horizon. A time of trouble which Sister White says no human pen can describe the magnitude of the ordeal that's about to take place. Because the sweet book is heading for some bitter time. We have more to say about September 11th, 2001. Shall we pray?
Heavenly Father, we wish to be those that partake of the increase of knowledge that you're bringing to your, your people at this time. We wish to be among the wise because we know that Jose warns that your people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. But we're Laodiceans. We're living in the history when we're increased with goods and we're, we think we need nothing. We ask that you'd use your spirit, your angel, and your providential workings to awaken us um, to our personal need of preparation and help us put the priorities of our life in order. For we want to be revived, but we know that every genuine revival is accompanied by reform. We need to change our lives in agreement with the revival that you're accomplishing. And it's a hard work, it's a scary work for we as Laodiceans to wake up to the, the time we've wasted and the habits that we've developed. Give us the wisdom, the discernment, and the, and the courage uh, to take up this work. Help us understand that you've prepared us for this time through your, your word. You've illustrated the end from the beginning. Help us to, to find that this, this revelation of prophetic history is the sweetness that you provided for us that allows us to stand in these times and be among those that partake of it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right, so now we're going to open for questions. If anybody has questions. Ben. Here, here, hold on. I was working at Kaiser in, as a physical therapist, and they had the television on on 911, and I saw this. Of, it was amazing. It was incredible. But uh, uh, I didn't know the meaning at the time either of, uh, of uh, 1989, but I knew it was a major event. I didn't think I'd graduate from, from Loma Linda School of Physical Therapy when the events of the fall of the Soviet Union and Ronald Reagan and the John Paul II. I knew there was something significant. I didn't know what it was. I didn't think I'd graduate. There was a big earthquake the day of my graduation. But um, you mentioned that uh, there were events taking place in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. What are those events? Uh, well, I don't remember mentioning that, but um, I don't doubt that I... <coughs> for a long, I'll tell you a mistake that, uh, or something I didn't see that I taught that is, it's okay to call it a mistake. When I understood that Daniel 11 verse 40 was fulfilled with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, I knew the next thing to happen was the Sunday law in the United States, so I was teaching that, and the way that I taught it, I conveyed the idea that 1989 was the fulfillment of verse 40, the next thing to happen is verse 41, and I didn't at that time understand that we needed to recognize that the history of verse 40 continues until verse 41. So all of this history that we now see of September 11th and those things connected are still part of the history of verse 40. And there are, as you point out, there's, there's prophetic history that's represented in verses 1 through 3 that will precede verse 4. And uh, <coughs> for, for me, that, that prophetic history, there's a, there's a lot of lines that it's valid to lay over here. Um, this here is when the sprinkling of the latter rain begins. And if you read closely the information about the latter rain, the, la the first work of the latter rain is to awaken us. And it awakens every one of us in our Laodicean condition. When it awakens us, we, we have not perfected uh, Christian character where, where we can receive the seal of God. It awakens us, and then we have the opportunity to bring our life into agreement with this message. So. One of the th events that's taking place, probably the most important, it's, it's in this time that God is attempting to awaken his people, identify that the judgment of the living has begun. Ooh, that's a hard thing to say. <laughs> people don't like to hear it, but it's underway in order that they might finish the work of character de development before verse 41 in, in Revelation 18.4 arrives, the Sunday law, because it, there's no time to develop character in a crisis. Sister White teaches that, and the Sunday law is a crisis. The Sunday law crisis is where we will demonstrate the character that we prepared here. So one of the events that's going on is that, th that it is now that the, those in Adventism that are responding accordingly to this message are, 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 are rising up. Now, I, I believe that um, 
where Sister White says, you know, that the, the people of the United States forced the legislators to pass a Sunday law, and that's paraphrased, but this is what she says then, in order to restore temporal prosperity, that before the Sunday law, something happens to the temporal prosperity of the United States. So one of the events, prophetically, that I think takes place here, and in the passage that I pointed, for a little, pointed forward to a, a little bit in our last presentation, um, Testimonies, Volume 9, beginning in page 11, she weaves into that history the economic crisis and after she speaks about the people of the United States or the leaders of the United States struggling to in vain to put business operations on a more secure basis she goes immediately into James chapter 5 go ye too old rich men weep and howl because your you know your gold is cankered and your silver is rusted or whatever James, she's saying that the economic crisis in the United States is also being identified in James and the thing that is amazing about James what makes gold and silver uh, valuable is it doesn't rust okay and James says it becomes rusted so it's implying that there's an economic collapse that takes place that is partly a retribution to the to the rich men of the world that have been greedy but it's also saying that it's, it's unexpected. Even, even if we have the evidence that the, the globalists intended to bring about an economic collapse in order to introduce a one world monetary system, they're not in control of God's providential history. He is. And what happens here is something that he's governing, not them. So I think before verse 41, you should see an economic collapse. And part of the economic instability can be traced to the money that's spent on trying to restrain Islam, okay, because that, that it's the prophetic marker. The prophetic marker is not so much that the Twin Towers were blown down on September 11th. The prophetic marker is that on August 11th, 1840, Islam was restrained, and it's prefiguring when Islam was restrained. No matter who was behind 9-11, immediately thereafter, George Bush went out and, and put a restraint on Islam and someone, I think Dwayne, but someone here since we've been here was telling me that in Obama's speech yesterday he restated the same commitment to the war of, on terrorism that George Bush has even though all, all he was, you know, in his campaign he was saying different he's, he's committed to continuing the restraint that was placed on Islam and in that sense, you know, you count the money that's going into the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, all that they are probably doing with, you know, undercover work. It's had to contribute to the financial instability. That's some of the events that that I think are prophetically identified. But maybe that's not your question. Before they didn't want to do this billion dollar bailout of the bad loans. Now they're trying to go forward with it. Even though they've already put a trillion dollars into it. There's you know who no George end. Soros no is? Well, yeah, I heard of him. Okay, I, I, I don't really know who he is. But he, I mean, he's the money man behind the liberal side of the Democratic Party. And he said last week that, uh, and a friend of mine pointed this out because we both understand Daniel 11 and 40, 40 and 41 today. They, he said, George Soros was complaining. He says, this economic collapse that isn't over, when it reaches its collapse, because he's thinking it's all going to collapse, it's going to parallel the collapse of the Soviet Union. So for, for my friend and I, we're saying, okay, he's seeing the historical event of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Daniel 11, verse 40, and now he's seeing this crisis, which leads to the Sunday law. He's understanding it has the same historical significance, and this is a guy in the world, you know, but he's seeing the it. The people, just to comment, the people that are claiming Obama's plan, not against Obama, you know, I think he may be trying, but his plan to, to uh, jumpstart the economy, the weaknesses of partly are that you mentioned before the greed, combine that with the, un the social programs that we have in this country. And you know, you've, you've got jobs going overseas. Other signs, I think, you can correct me, but you know, the fall of Rome, there's parallels between the fall of Rome. We've got uncontrolled borders. We have s battles occurring on our borders now. And uh, a lot of this is lawlessness. H have, have you ever read Ecclesiastical Megalomania? 
Yes, I read that book. I have that yeah. book. If if you don't if you don't have that book, it's a very good book. It's not written by an Adventist. Ecclesiastical means church, and megalomania means the the condition when you think you're God. So it's about the the papacy, you know, the church that thinks it's God. And in that, he goes in and demonstrates that the political structure that has been invented by the papacy is socialism, communism, Nazism, all these isms that we have, but it, those are all the pr political manifestation of the Roman Catholic Church, and he documents it really well. So, so when we see the Democrats here wanting go to go into European-style socialism, what they're really wanting to do, whether they understand it or not, is they're wanting to take up the political structure that was designed by the Roman Catholic Church. And Sister White says, um, what is it? The, the, it's not principles, but some the... No, not, not, not that one. The Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the Protestants. It, it's something like that. She says that we're going to take their principles up and we're going to protect them and care, them and care for them and that's what we're doing. We're moving right into her political structure. Of course she's the one that's only the one that is best prepared to manage that political structure. Do you, do you know that Sister White says there's going to be a civil war in the United States? But also in the United States. How many are aware of that she says that? There will be another civil war. But when you read the quote, she says the reason for the civil war is it's going to be class warfare between the rich and the poor. It's financial. But that's after the Sunday law or before? I, I don't know. Right <laughs> it, but you can see it getting ready. Jeff, in your opinion, um, the small time of trouble, would that be the economical collapse, the crisis economically? And then the, the big time of trouble would be Sunday law persecution, or, or would it be more of no, the last plague? But Sister White never uses the word little ti time of trouble, but it's used in Adventism. And when you, you look at how it's been commonly understood in Adventism, you can... You can bring prophecy to identify what the little time of trouble is. The little time of trouble begins at the Sunday law in the United States. Okay? The big time of trouble, that's easy. To, Sister White's clear. The great time of trouble begins when human probation closes and Michael stands up. So that's your first point of reference. Great time of trouble, Michael stands up, human probation closes. And that would be the seven last plagues? Yep. And the time of Jacob's trouble. The little time of trouble begins at the Sunday law. And f the Sunday law crisis from the Sunday law in the United States until Michael stands up is also the one hour of Revelation 18 and, and Revelation 17. The, 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 lo the logic is, you, it's very difficult. I don't think you, I, I hope if there is one that someone will find it. But I've never found a spirit of prophecy quote where, you, where she's crystal clear that the death decree at, at the end of time marks the point when Michael stands up and human probation closes. I, I don't know of a, a proof text in the spirit of prophecy, but with these lines of prophecy, it's pretty clear that the death decree takes place right at the close of probation. That's down here. That's marking the end of the little time of trouble. The, the, it, but when I said, Revelation 17, it says the ten kings agree to give their kingdom to the beast. The United Nations agrees to place the one world government in the hands of the papacy, the beast, for one hour. That's not prophetic time. Another verse says for a short space. The one hour of Bible prophecy is from the Sunday law in the United States until Michael stands up. Okay, it's not a, not a period, it's not a, it's not time prophecy. It's it just expressing a period of time. And what's interesting, what's interesting, if you take the term one hour, there's only one book in the Old Testament where you're going to find one hour. Okay, but in the New Testament, when it talks about one hour, you'll find that the testimony connected with the one hour in the New Testament is identifying this history. This history, the little time of trouble, 
is the one hour of the Sunday law testing time that begins in the United States and glo goes until human probation closes. And I you remember when Jesus says, in that time period they'll bring you before judges and magistrates. He says, but in that hour, don't worry about what you're going to speak. The words will be given to you. You'll find in the New Testament, when the one hour is expressed, it's contributing truths to the Sunday law crisis, the one hour. But the, the only book in the Old Testament that uses the expression one hour is the book of Daniel. And it connects here too. Because in this hour, in Daniel chapter 5, in that very hour, a hand appeared and began writing many, many tekel And you'll find the four places where the one hour um, is identified in the book of Daniel. It's talking about the time period when Babylon comes down. The very hour that Nebuchadnezzar said, this is the great Babylon that I have built. Judgment came on him. And this is, this is the hour of judgment of Babylon in Revelation 18. That, yeah, it adds up to 25, 20. Oh yeah, yeah. Because the economic when national posse ar arrives, nas national posse is followed by national ruin. But Sister White says every country on the globe will follow the actions of the United States. So when Brazil passes its national Sunday law, national apostasy in Brazil will be followed by national ruin, and all down the line, the economy continues to implode. And that's why in Daniel 11, verse 43. Um, the king in the north, the papacy, when he's taking control of the world, it says that the Egyptians, the people of the world, are willing to give him his go their gold and their silver and their, silver and their precious things. In this time period, the financial structure is given over to the papacy, and the world in Daniel 11 verse 43 is symbolized by Egypt, and the time when the Egyptians were willing to give their gold and silver and precious things away was in the plagues of Egypt. It's saying that in this time period, the world is being brought to its knees, even financially, and it creates the environment for the papacy to take control of the world. Well, it leads up. It escalates. It all escalates. And Sister White says, in Christian experience, that from the time Michael stands up until he returns is a number of days. And the time period of the seven last plagues is a number of days. Isn't that nice to know? S she doesn't say a number of weeks or a number of months. Oh, hold on. No, prophecy, time's no longer. Even in the Romanian society, there's a lot of people that are the under understanding that after the Sunday law will, will be set out, that there's still about a year, from one year to three years time. In the little time of trouble, you could make an argument from the Sunday law in the United States until Michael stands up that it's over a year because there's a, there's a passage, I think it's in Country Living, where the inference of Sister White is, is that we will be taking at least one year's harvest from our orchards during that time period. And, and that's, a, that's a broad paraphrase, but that's the logic. That, that's the one point... Uh, where I know that people go is that passage to say y you're obviously in the little time of trouble you're out there for at least a year because you're you're getting a harvest off your fruit trees during that time period uh, all right so we better start going because there's going to be a hundred kids in the line so we want to beat them <laughs> um, um,